control. And good evening, everyone. Good evening. There we go. Some wonderful energy in the room. And it's a pleasure to have you all, have you all here. Uh, I'm going to just compare, compare the evening, uh, this evening. I'm not going to give you detailed slides or presentations. I just want to try and put you in the right frame of mind for some of the excellent speakers that we've got later on. Uh, there's going to be lots of investment ideas, investment objectives, and things that you might want to think about for your own portfolios. And so all I want to do is just give you a little bit of a story, um, a little bit about my past and, and, and childhood, which you're probably not interested in. But in particular, just what get you in the right frame of mind of think of the uh, investments that you're going to hear about this evening and how you might use them in your own individual portfolios. So let's crack on with that then. OK, are there any skiers in the audience? This is audience participation, get involved, fantastic. There's some skiers in the audience. I am a skier, but I'm a novice skier. I only came to skiing in the past couple of years. My skiing is described as courageous. Uh, it's definitely not skillful. Um, but I do remember, and the reason I got into skiing uh, and couldn't help getting involved in skiing was, I remember sitting as a child back at home with, with my father on Sunday afternoon, and you'd listen, you'd watch Ski Sunday. Does anyone remember that? Ski Sunday and the music, Franz Klammer in his canary yellow suit, bombing down those hills. And these days, skiing is absolutely the blue ribbon event in the Winter Olympics. It's the one that everyone wants to win. It's the one with the prestige. If you want to be in the Winter Olympics, downhill, downhill skiing is the event that you want to win. But it wasn't always the case. If you go back to the original uh, Winter Olympics, first one was in 1924, the original Winter Olympics, the one that you really wanted to win, any nation with any pride whatsoever wanted to win the four-man bobsleigh. And why did they want to win the four-man bob over every other sport that was out there? Because it represented national pride, it represented the team sport, and as you can see, there was some phenomenal pieces of engineering that went into the bobsleighs. Uh, that's a scary looking piece of equipment. Not entirely sure what the steering wheel is, is gonna do, but the, the, the format of the sport hasn't changed since 1928. In 1928, they decided to experiment with a five-man bobsleigh. It turns out putting five men on a piece of scaffolding and throwing them down a hill isn't the safest thing to do. And a couple of people died in the 1928 Olympics. So in 1932, they reverted back to the format that you know well, which is the four-man bobsleigh. And the Americans were the absolute heroes in this sport. Up until uh, 1960s, the Americans had won pretty much every one of the four-man bobsleighs. The Swiss had won a couple, but up until 1960s, the Americans were absolutely the people to beat when it came to four-man bob. And then it stopped. And no one knows why. And it didn't come back. In 2002, they held the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City because they thought, they thought that would be the way that they would get the four-man bob back into, a, into gold for the US, but it failed. It failed again in 2006, and so they called the A-team. They called this chap, probably the cleverest man you've never heard of. This guy here is a guy called Jeff Seder, and Jeff Seder has a doctorate and degree in just about every discipline you can think of. He's a doctorate of biomechanics, he has a law degree, he has an MBA from Harvard, and a couple of other degrees just for the hell of it. He's the smartest guy you've probably never heard of. And he has a couple of passions. One of his passions is sports, and in particular horses, we'll come back to that later. And the other one is data and science. He's a biomechanic who's obsessed with data. And so they called Jeff because he was the leader in biomechanics in 2007. And he analysed the US uh, four-man bobsleigh team. He analysed them by filming them in slow motion and analysing the data that he was able to collect on the teams. Now, four-man bobsleigh is essentially a gravity-assisted sport. The common perceived wisdom for the four-man bobsleigh before Jeff got involved was you get four big, strong, burly men to push the bobsleigh as fast as they can in the first couple of seconds in the race get them to jump into the bobsleigh, and gravity does the rest. And that was the common perceived wisdom until Jeff came along. And what Jeff realized is when he studied the four-man bobsleigh team in the US, is these four big, strong, burly men were too big, too strong, and too burly. What they were doing, they were pushing the four-man bobsleigh with such power that it would create vibrations within the rails, and that vibration created friction and ultimately slowed the bobsleigh down. 
So Jeff sacked the four-man bobsleigh team in the US and recruited instead three ballet dancers and a driver. And those three ballet dancers were big and strong, but they went barely. They have finesse. And they pushed not just fast, they pushed efficiently. They pushed that four-man four bob efficiently and got into the bobsleigh efficiently until in 2010, the US were in the proud recipients of the gold and the four-man bobsleigh 2010 Winter Olympics. Now, you may be wondering, what all this got to do with investments? I can see some furrowed brows. You are thinking it. Well, let me tell you a bit more about Jeff. Jeff's real passion is horse racing. Uh, he's absolutely obsessed with, with horses. And so, emboldened by his success in 2010, and having pocketed a nice check from the uh, US Olympic Committee, what he did is he took that money and he went off to study horses. And he had this idea, which is, how do you choose a great horse when they're a one year old? Which is what you have to do if you're buying a horse at auction in order to race it as a three year old, you yeah, buy it as a one year old. How do you choose the best horse as a one year old? You don't have a lot of data on these horses, they've just been foaled. Uh, you don't have a real idea of how they're going to run. And what the common perceived wisdom, this is the, co this is the theme of, of, of my chat here, the common perceived wisdom was. You bought the horse as a one-year-old based on the quality of its parents. It was based on the bloodline. It was based on the success of the mare and, uh, and the sire and its grandparents. So bloodline was the way in which you bought a one-year-old horse in order to race it as a three-year-old. Now, Jeff had done a lot of research on this and was able to conclude that there was one guarantee if you bought a horse based on its bloodline. It would be expensive. There was no guarantee whatsoever as to its provenance when it became a three-year-old. None whatsoever. There's no correlation between the bloodline of a horse and its performance as a three-year-old. There was a very, very, very strong correlation between the bloodline of a horse and the price you pay for it as a one-year-old. And so what he did instead is 2010, 2011, 2012, he measured everything he could on thousands and thousands and thousands of horses. If you could measure it, Jeff measured it. He filmed every single horse and watched them in slow motion, drawing on some of his experience from his bobsleigh days. He collected all this data and waited two years. So the horses that he'd measured in 2010 as one-year-olds, he waited until 2012 and looked at which horses were successful. He then took the population of horses that were successful and looked at the data that they displayed when they were horses in 2010 and was able to find there are two things that will, deter or will increase the likelihood of buying a good horse as a one-year-old. Just two things and two things only. And this guy took thousands of measurements. First one is its ability to change gait coming around the left-hand corner. And the second one is the size of it, the horse's left ventricular in its heart. Every other measurement had no bearing on, on the result whatsoever. And he took this information, he went to all the major stables around the world, he went to the Sheikh Mohammeds of this world and tried to sell them these, uh, these, um, the, the data and the information he found. He told them, you're paying too much for your horses, you're buying the wrong horses. Work with me and we will find you the best horses at the best possible price. Now, the Sheikh Mohammed didn't care. This is play money for these guys. And so, he came back and said, yeah, these people won't listen to me. The common perceived wisdom is so embedded within the industry that I'm not going to get these people to change their mind. Except there was one Egyptian guy who did, you know, he was a multi-millionaire, but he didn't have the billions of the Sheikh Mohammeds of this world, and he wasn't able to compete. The horses that he wanted to buy at auction, he was outbid for every single time by the people with even more money. There's always someone with a bigger boat, isn't there? And so the Egyptian chap, hired Jeff and took him off to, to some of the auctions. Uh, in 2012 now, uh, sorry, 2013, he took him off to, to the auctions and they saw a number of horses and they, Jeff measured all the, all the data he needed. And he came back and he pulled the Egyptian guy aside and he said, don't tell anyone. I think I've found the horse of a lifetime. And it was this horse here who 
you obviously don't recognize. Uh, <laughs> it was this horse here. Uh, this horse is named American Pharaoh. And they bought American Pharaoh in 2013 as a one-year-old. And they raced the horse and they trained it and uh, did all the things that you would uh, as, as a horse owner. Until 2015, you're probably familiar with the classic races on the flat in the UK, the Guineas, the Oaks, the Derby, etc. Uh, in the US, there are three classic races. And the three classic races, um, I've forgotten the names of, but the last one uh, is, no, it's, anyone know the, the three classics in the US? We must have some Kentucky horse racing. Derby. Kentucky Derby, that's the one I'm looking for. The Preakness Stakes and the Belmont Stakes. There we go. Couldn't remember the first one. Okay, so they're, and they ran in that order. 2015, Kentucky Derby. American Pharaoh romps home first. 2013, Preakness Stakes, American Pharaoh romps home first. Only 12 horses in history have ever won all three classic races. And this picture here is American Pharaoh coming in first at Belmont Park and winning the Belmont Stakes. Only 12 horses in history have ever done that. And this horse was bought for $150,000 at auction, which is a lot of money for $150,000 for a horse that subsequently goes on and earns $100 million at stud is an absolute bargain. And like I say, what's this got to do with investments? Well, what it's got to do with investments is if you take some of those themes of challenge common perceived wisdoms, have some human, human intelligence, understand what it is you're trying to, uh, to, to study, and bring lots of data into your investment process, and you're going to get lots of information today, absorb it all, and it'll be sent out, sent out to you. Absorb all of this information with your own human intelligence and challenge the common perceived wisdoms, you can, lead, you can uh, generate more efficient and better returns for your portfolio. So I'll give you a good example, and it's a great example when you consider some of the speakers that we've got today. There is a theory in, the, in, uh, in portfolio management, it's called modern portfolio theory. And it's been in existence since 1952. I think it's about time it lost the adjective modern. It's just poor for theory. Now, in 1952, Harry Markowitz suggested that if you wanted to build a more efficient portfolio, you would have different stocks in your portfolio that did different things. I'm paraphrasing here, but that's ultimately why this guy won a Nobel Prize. Have different stocks that do different things. It's the equivalent of having in your portfolio a company that sells ice creams and a company that sells umbrellas you're now diversified from the risk of the weather. If it's sunny, your ice cream portfolio does well. If it's raining, your umbrella company does well. You've removed the risk of weather from your portfolio. It's a more efficient portfolio. Now, in 1952, Harry Markovitz said that if you diversified your portfolio, not just in your home country, but if you spread your money around the world, you would get access to better investment ideas, but more importantly, you would get access to the companies that did different things at different times. And that's been the common perceived wisdom throughout Portfolio 30 ever since. Diversify your portfolio on a geographical basis and you'll end up with a more efficient portfolio. Except a couple of things have happened since 1952. The most important one for the purposes of what we're talking about today is globalization. So in 1952, the way in which UK stocks and European and, U uh, and US stocks moved together, they did move together at different times because they were exposed to different business cycles. But post-globalization, these portfolios now move all at the same time. And so the diversi by diversification benefit, the efficiency you bring into your portfolio by holding UK and European and US stocks ain't what it used to be. And so we would argue that you need to think a little wider. Don't just diversify your portfolio across um, developed, uh, modern, econ westernized economies, if you want to call them that. Diversify much, much wider than that. Diversify across the whole globe and also consider sector-based exposures in your portfolio. So this chart here shows you that if you hold UK large cap and European large caps, the correlation, which is a measure of how togetherness these stocks move. The correlation's really high these days. During the European debt crisis in 2011, UK and European stocks also pretty much moved one for one correlation with each other. But if you consider now UK large cap and global technology stocks and have them in your portfolio, the correlation is much, much lower. 
And so if you put all of these things into your portfolio, it is possible to build more efficient portfolios. Let me show you what that looks like in Harry Markowitz language. Harry Markowitz was this guy who said, if you plot every portfolio you can think of on a risk and return axis, there will be some, some portfolios which are more efficient than others. And that gives rise to this idea of an efficient frontier. So all of these portfolios down here, which you can't see because I don't want to show you them, they're not as efficient as a portfolio which sits on that blue line. Anything that is to the bottom right of that blue line is an inefficient portfolio. So you always want to be trying to get more efficiency into your portfolios when you're building them. So that's what Markovitz standard portfolios look like. But if you now introduce more global exposure and sector-based exposures in your portfolios, it's possible to create a different efficient frontier. And so for the same level of risk, you get a higher level of return. And that's really just what I want to leave you with today as you think about the presentations that you're going to see from our other much more eloquent uh, and much more interesting uh, speakers. Think about how you're going to put these, portfolios, uh, these positions together in your portfolios and hopefully ask lots and lots and lots of questions at these guys at the end and none of them for me. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass you over to our, I'm going to pass you back to Roland, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.